Just how beatable is USC going to be on Friday? We speak with the LA Times USC beat reporter Ryan Cartji about the strengths and weaknesses of the Trojans ahead of Friday's matchup. And then to end the show, well, for the first round of games, come on, you know what it is. Five best bets. Let's go. You are Locked On Spartans, your daily podcast on the Michigan State Spartans, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Spartan friends, Spartan family, Locked On Spartans Nation, thank you so much for giving us a listen here. Well, at Locked On Spartans, your team in green and white five days a week as we are just two days away from the madness. If you're watching on YouTube on Wednesday night or if you're waking up and listening to this on Thursday morning, well, yeah, you, you know that we are less than 24 hours away from it being game day. Thanks a lot for spending some of this time here commiserating together and also getting to know USC a little bit more here in a hot second. And then, well, in the third segment, that's right. Come on. It's the greatest time to gamble. So we're going to get our five best bets in the mix before any of that. Hey, please rate review and subscribe to this here podcast or YouTube show. Any way you consume this media. Hey, thank you so much. Truly do appreciate it. Now let's stop burning time. Let's get to our guy, Ryan Cartji. We are welcome, not just on short notice for this gentleman, but also on a travel day for him. It is Ryan Karchi. He is the USC beat reporter of a little community paper known as the LA Times. Ryan, thanks a ton for your time, man. How on earth are you doing over there in soon-to-be Big Ten country? It uh, It's raining today. It's been raining a lot lately in wow. LA. So it's really, really the gray winter is really getting us prepared for Big Ten country. So yeah. No kidding. Okay, yeah, you're you're trading the palm trees and the sun-soaked skin for some gray in the winter in the near future. But uh, <laughs> you are heading up to uh, Columbus, I believe, for the first round games here. Uh, you know, following USC, what is the general consensus, either with the team, the program, or just Trojan fans about this first round matchup against Michigan State? About the location, about the time. What what's just the the general consensus here? You know, it's tough because I I do feel like with USC basketball, uh, you know, it's, it's a very inconsistent team. And I think sure. the expectations have been inconsistent similarly. Okay. Um, so I, you know, I, I think this, at this moment for this team, you know, we're kind of finding them entering a little bit of a lull, uh, you know, the end of the season, you know, ended with a thud, uh, against Arizona state in the Pac-12 tournament, similarly to Michigan state in the big 10 tournament. But, yep. you know, I, I think, you know, a lot of people here especially are interested in just the, the flavor of, uh, you know, future Big Ten matchup. But I think ultimately, you know, while this game, you know, if Michigan State's able to slow it down to its pace, uh, you know, I think that that may uh, help them out significantly. But I, I think the main focus has been on the three-point line uh, for USC. Mm -hmm. That was every player when I talked to them on, on Monday brought up, you know, we're going to need to stop them from the three-point line or we're not going to have a chance. So I think that's really where this game is is going to be won and lost. And I, I think it's really going to matter who's able to determine the pace of the game because these two teams play at very different paces. Yeah, and that's a stat that I've been beating into the ground this week on this show is that USC lets their opponents shoot 22.5 three-pointers per game. And MSC obviously shoots it pretty well, top five in the nation. But with that said... Let's talk about scary stats for us state fans. Uh, you guys have the second best opponent two-point field goal percentage in the country as well. How or why is that? Is it some players making hay? Is it just the way the defense works? Or how has USC been so successful at that this season? Well, so this year is kind of interesting because, you know, previously Andy Enfield have gone with a two-big system mm -hmm. and lineup pretty much all the time. This year they've switched to four guards, but that fourth guard – Drew Peterson just happens to be 6'9". So uh, yeah. when teams are forced to kind of match that that speed and that quickness with an extra guard, Drew Peterson's length kind of makes up for that. So I, I think that has a lot to do with USC just being strong, kind of defending the mid-range especially. But they do have, you know, two essentially seven-foot bigs uh, who are really, you know, just general rim protectors. I know Joshua Morgan uh, ended up being on the all-pack 12 defensive team largely because his defensive prowess. I mean, uh, one of the better defenders on the West Coast. And, you know, I, I think he started off the season with a seven-block game. 
Um, okay. <laughs> he, he's had he's had a couple games of four blocks or more. So, you know, if he is able to really establish himself as a defensive presence uh, in the paint, I, I think that'll go a long way. That said, you know, when he's been out of the lineup, it's been a completely different story for USC. Okay. I think, you know, some of the best approaches to, to take on USC this season have been, you know, either teams with the presence on the inside, like say in Arizona, who has, you know, two skilled big men or yeah. a team that can drive and get Josh Morgan into foul trouble. Suddenly that bench becomes very thin. Uh, and, you know, once USC doesn't have that advantage and it's interior defense, it doesn't really have an advantage anywhere specifically on defense. Okay. So it really all starts in the middle and, you know, emanates out and, I think, you know, if Michigan State is able to, you know, make USC vulnerable at all on the inside, given their prowess on the outside, it, it's going to be a tough day for USC. Yeah, understandable. And what other strengths has USC picked up as of late? Because, I mean, just in the middle of February, they were bubble-ish. But now, you know, they kind of squarely somewhat made it into the tournament with not, you know, any serious drama. Is it just, you know, someone has taken over as the alpha? Was there like a switch flipped? Has there been, you know, injury bugs that have been resolved? Or we can get to that later, but I think it's the opposite. But what is the reason for, you know, the late surge at the end of the season here for USC? Well, ultimately, this was two things. This was a young team. So I think a lot of the inexperienced players who maybe struggled to find their footing in the non-conference schedule really started to pick it up towards the end of January. They had a win over UCLA at home, uh, which was easily their best win of the season. Pretty, pretty dominant uh, throughout that game. And that was kind of a turning point, I think for a lot of those young players. But I think, you know, just the rise of guys like uh, Kobe Johnson, like Arie Sticks and Waters, both playing really well down the stretch, I think makes a big difference, especially when they're both able to score. But Probably the biggest change has been the rise of Boogie Ellis over the course of, especially this last month. I mean, the last 12 games that they played, Boogie's averaging almost 23 points a game. He, you okay. know, he was he, he was not he was not necessarily a floor general type guard before, but now he's kind of developed into a complete point guard, someone who's thinking of other teammates when he's driving as opposed to just trying to get his, which was sort of his mo last year. So okay, just him. Him becoming a more complete point guard has really opened up the offense to be able to do a lot more different things and has made all the players around him better. So I think he's really the key to this team. And last year, you know, he really struggled in the first round game of the NCAA tournament against Miami. And I think if Michigan State is able to slow him down, I imagine they will be, you know, putting a lot of ball pressure on him just in general. If they're able to slow him down, then yeah, again, it's going to be a long day for USC. So I think ultimately yeah. a lot of these, a lot of these approaches for USC hinge on one very specific thing happening. And if Michigan State is able to upend that, I think it becomes a lot more of a scramble for for USC on Friday. And that answers, you know, where I was going to take the next question is what kind of a player is Boogie Ellis? But, you know, he's not just a nice scoring threat, but also fills everyone else in as well. Is there any one or two players in particular that you've also seen kind of rise as Boogie has lifted his game up? Well, one guy who I think is going to be critical in this game, especially when you're talking about, you know, great three-point shooting for Michigan mm-hmm. State is Kobe, Kobe Johnson. Okay. Um, it, his family has an NBA pedigree. His brother is currently in the NBA right now. Um, Andy Enfield has regularly this season called him the best on-ball defender in college basketball. And while that might sound extreme, I, I don't think it's actually as extreme as it does sound. I, you know, he has been – a complete shutdown defender this year, you know, going from only playing seven minutes a game last year, you know, barely registering on the offensive yeah. end, especially to averaging over nine points per game. Uh, he's one of the better three point shooters on the team. And he's, he's got the lockdown defense that again, really helps USC defend from the three point line beyond him. And maybe drew Peterson, because he has the link USC is not exactly long in its guards. So I, I do think that, you know, if Michigan State is able to, you know, draw plays that get those three-point shooters open, um, that would be a big advantage. But Kobe Johnson is going to be the guy to combat that. Be right back with Ryan in a hot second, but first need to talk your ear off about FanDuel Sportsbook. That's right, the number one sportsbook in America for, in my opinion, the number one time of the year to get in on the gambling action. 
Gang, it is the perfect time to download FanDuel because if you are a new customer this March Madness, well, it only gets sweeter for you. That's right. New customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. And if you are a, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's back in bonus bets. If your first bet doesn't win, almost forgot to include that. And if you are already a customer of FanDuel like myself, well, hey, they got a five dollar essentially free bet for everyone you bet five dollars on march madness if it loses you're gonna get that back in bonus bets as well they have parlay insurance cooking this march madness they got a lot of fun action cooking we're gonna get to it more in the third segment actually just download the fanduel sportsbook app it's safe secure super easy to use and you get paid instantly with mr fanduel this is not like the other sports books where you're waiting days upon days at a time to get your winnings. No, no, no. Mr. FanDuel is lining your pockets as soon as he possibly can, which let me tell you, is pretty quick. FanDuel also lets you combine your bets for a chance at a larger payout with same game parlay. Don't miss the chance to get in on your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. And I swear you're staring at my notes because Kobe Johnson was where I was going to take this next. And you're just bing, 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 just hitting everything that I want to talk about here. So next up on our list, Drew Peterson. What is going on with him? He's had the back injury. He says he's 100%. You can't do much other than just take his word for it. But but what has he been like the last few weeks? And is that going to be another massive factor in this game like all of us think it will be? It definitely could be. I know that's... You know, Andy Enfield was talking this week about how at the beginning of the season, he had two players he knew he could rely on, Boogie Ellis and Drew Peterson. Okay. And he needed both both of them, essentially, to be point guards. And that is, that's been a big part of this offense is that Drew Peterson has really, instead of being as erratic as he used to be in the past, this year he's calmed way down. He's more of a passer uh, than he okay. has been in the past. So I, I think you know, just his vision really opens up, especially for – some of the other wing players on this team. So I do think they desperately need him at 100%. Now the question is, will he be at 100% by Friday? Now the last couple of weeks, he assured that he would be you know, heading into the Pac-12 tournament, and he was nowhere close to that against Arizona okay. State. Uh, ended up only shooting two of 12 from the field. And you know, while he was maybe not as hindered as he was in the previous week, he was still definitely feeling it. Now, the other day on Monday, he did go through his first full practice uh, okay. since straining his back. So all signs are pointing towards him being 100%. But again, it's a, it's a really fickle thing. Uh, backs can just sort of flare up at any moment. Maybe the flight over uh, stiffened his back. It's hard to say. So they've been you know going through maintenance with it pretty much every day, massage, rehab, all that. So... You know, they're they're working very hard to make sure it's 100 percent, I think, because they know just how critical he is in a game like this. And it's not a matter of him playing or not. He will play. Uh, mm -hmm. He actually hasn't missed a game as in his entire college career. So that's crazy. I don't think he <laughs> I don't think he'd let this be the one. But uh, yeah. whether he's going to be at 100 uh, percent, we won't know until game time. It's just back injuries are just so weird and it's just annoying too. If you've never had back pain, you're the luckiest person out there. I wouldn't wish it against my worst enemy or my favorite team's first round opponent in March. Uh, it's, it's terrible. So hopefully he's, he's doing fine. Um, yeah. I didn't even think about the flight, just sitting on that plane for three, four hours. That, that can't be fun. That can't be fun. Not a lot of connecting flights to uh, Columbus. I've learned. So no, <laughs> it's, a, it's, <laughs> it's shocking. It's, it's, it's a tough travel. <laughs> Yeah, you don't say. Um, how deep is the bench for USC? It, it, has this lineup been tapered to a seven-man rotation, six-man rotation, or does USC still play, you know, nine deep, let's say? Or what, what are we looking at here? This is a lot thinner of a team than USC has played with in okay. recent years. Um, now, a lot of that depends, too, on the health of Vinci Wachukwu, who is a five-star freshman. Um, mm -hmm. suffered sudden cardiac arrest last summer. So he hadn't really gotten going until the second half of the season. He, yeah. Miraculously so even at that. But uh, he's also been dealing with a back injury. It's going around on this team, I guess. But he, uh, he's been, he has not been practicing, whereas Drew Peterson has. Now, okay. Andy Enfield called him a game-time decision. 
I would lean towards it being 50 50, if not a little under 50 50. Uh, and that's, that's tough. I, you know, I mentioned yeah. the thin bench behind Josh Morgan, uh, Vince Uachuku would be the first guy off the bench, uh, for Josh Morgan. So, you know, without him, you know, they're leaning on a lot less proven guys and they're going to have to play Morgan quite a bit. So again, the foul trouble aspect of this comes into play even more so, but, you know, beyond that, you know, a sticks and waters is a, a pretty significant contributor off the bench. He's really kind of their spark plug. Uh, guard in that sense, the sixth man of the year in the Pac-12. Um, so he is a you know a starting quality player who's coming off the bench. But beyond that, it, it's pretty thin. Um, yeah. So it, again, it, it's kind of been with this team. You know, if the key guys don't have it in a given day, there's not a lot of support beyond them. So it, it starts to get a little bit dicey uh, if, say, a Boogie Ellis or a Drew Peterson start to struggle and. Again, I, there's a there's very much a path for Michigan State to make it difficult on USC in these moments. It's just a question of whether they'll be able to. Yeah, I mean, MSU fans know all too well about that, having a, a thin bench when things aren't going well for the starters. But we're going to try our best, I guess. And we're also going to try our best to get as much sleep as possible. But the March Madness anxiety is already up to here. Like, I'm going to be losing all sorts of sleep the next two nights. So I'm going to make it your job, Ryan, to just give us state fans just something to ease our minds a little bit. What's some good news? What's like a weakness or a vulnerability that USC has that can just make us state fans a, a little relaxed about Friday? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. I think ultimately the three-point shooting is going to be make a major difference. Okay. Uh, you know, this is at USC now. They have had stretches uh, where they can shoot really well from three, but they've also had searches where, you know, their last, their loss against Oregon state late in the season, they shot one of 15 from three. Okay. So they are prone to lows like that. And their last time out, you know, was not necessarily their strongest effort uh, in terms of yeah. shooting. Now they're also sort of entering into this game and Andy Enfield has kind of laid the groundwork for the fact that, you know, there's been a lot of adversity. They've been dealing with sickness and injury. Sure. Just the fact that he's bringing that up right before March, yeah. I think says gives you a little bit of insight into how he's feeling about the current status of the team. Now, again, I ultimately think this game just comes down to who's shooting the ball better and who's defending the perimeter better. Uh, and ultimately, one of these teams was you know one of the top five three point shooting teams in the country this year, and the other was you know middle of the road defending the three point line. So. We'll I think it. if you're looking for if you're looking for a reason to to root or to expect Michigan State to win this game, I, I think you know, just the fact that their three point prowess is so much stronger than USC's. USC will have to have a very good game from three, and it's yep. you know completely a toss up on that front with them. Then, really quick before I let you go and you know start your travels to Columbus, I would be failing as a host of a Talking Head program if I didn't ask you for a prediction on Friday's game. So, what, what do you got for us here? You know, I've honestly gone back and forth on this. Yeah, same. Uh, and yeah. I, I don't even I don't even know if I've changed my bracket since I've changed okay. my mind uh, about this. But, you know, this morning I woke up and I just started thinking that I, I just don't see how USC can stop Michigan State from the three point line. I, I think ultimately, Tom, it, it, you know, if we're talking about an even matchup, you know, I'm looking at one guy who is the active leader in final four appearance. That helps. Coach. Yeah, <laughs> and one guy, and one guy who has been to the lead eight one time. Yeah. So I, I just, I just think that the the difference is pretty significant when you're talking about, you know, a very even matchup. Now that that's a very easily could be a ten point USC win. Oh yeah. Uh, if certain things go one way, but I, I really do think this is one of the coin flips of the first round. So I'm going to say that Michigan State ultimately, I think USC starts with a lead. Michigan State climbs back, USC goes into a second half slump, and Michigan State ends up winning by, say, four or five points. That sounds like that'll shave four years off my life, but hey, that's okay. That, <laughs> that ends in a win, so we'll take it. Ryan, can't thank you enough for all your time, man. Again, especially on short notice, especially on a travel day, um, a long travel day at that. So best of luck on your journey and uh, covering March Madness as long as that shall be for the USC Trojans. So really appreciate you, man. Yeah, of course. Anytime. You got it. Huge thanks to Ryan for dropping by with all the knowledge, all the tidbits, and what there is to know about the USC Trojans ahead of Friday's game. 
made me feel a little better and a little worse at the same time. So it would, that's just March Madness for you. Um, mood swings, not every hour, not every minute, but within the second of one another. But that is just the beauty of this season that we love. And we also love the gambling aspect of March Madness, whether it's just your $5 bracket pool that you've entered, or hey, if you want to go game by game and bet all 63 of these games individually in March, well, I don't recommend that. Play to the beat of your own drum. Uh, let's let's make things fun. Again, make things fun. And let's all remember that like we're not going to retire off this money by any chance. You know, I, that's going to be very hard to do. So let's just make sure that we keep this what it is, an entertainment product. Now, let's go ahead and get in on our five best bets. All these lines, courtesy of America's number one sports book. We're talking FanDuel. So let's get into the mix here. We have three games that we're going to pick. We also have one prop and then one team total. That is what's on the menu today, and these are all for Thursday games. We will be back tomorrow doing a full slate for Friday, so let's get it popping. Illinois, plus one and a half against Arkansas. That is a 430 tip. Nice little matinee show for you right there. And this is a stat that I like to pull out when talking gambling time and time again. And sometimes it's a stat that I... Um, cheat against. I fall for the trap sometimes, and that is the public betting. That's right. 22% of the bets are on Illinois, and I like that. Vegas is lighting up the strip for a reason because they take the money from the public. So anytime Vegas is going to be on a team upwards of 70 or more percent, we're going to run right toward that light. So yes, 22% of the bets are on Illinois. And that actually shocks me. I figured that, okay, people would be on Arkansas. But to this tune, not that much because Arkansas is abysmal at shooting the ball. They shoot 31.7% from three. They shoot a not nice percentage from the free throw line of 69%. And Illinois, just matchup wise, I I like the way they're built against this Arkansas team, especially one that can't really shoot it. So they got to get to the lane. Well, Okay, Illinois is a lawn team. They are a rangy team, and they have some rim protection, starting with Dane Danger, and even just penetrating the arc is a little tough to do against Illinois. Uh, They are top 10 in block percentage as well. So not only do I love, love that the public only has 22% of their bets in the Illini right now, but I also just love what I see on paper between these two teams. So I guess I'm putting on my Big Ten hat for the first one, and we are riding with the Fighting Brad Underwoods. Which one does that ever go wrong in March? But okay, we're gonna we're gonna go for it in the first round here in that eight verse nine game. Now, game number two. What I just said about loving to fade the public. Well, it only took me two picks to completely disregard that, and we are going to do one of the rarest things that you can do in March, and that is go against Duke. When Vegas is on their side, we're talking Oral Roberts plus six and a half against Duke at 7 10 p.m. 62% of the bets are on Oral Roberts. And I am drinking every drop of that Kool Aid that Oral Roberts is giving us. They are the fifth most experienced team in the country. Okay. On the flip side, Duke is the fifth least experienced team in the country. Funny how that works out. Max Asmus, all right? That is a name that you might know. Two years ago, when Oral Roberts made their Sweet 16 run, lit it up, even though they were a 15 seed. This guy was a bucket getter, still on the team. They have seven foot three uh, Connor Vandover, who also isn't just a tall tree in the post. He can jump out and hit a few shots as well. 35th in the country at three-point percentage, top 10 in two-point field goal percentage and free throw percentage. They are 30-4 and four on the season. They have not lost a game since January 9th. So not only do they believe, you know, they've won a lot, okay, but they are also experienced as well. They have the stats to back it up. And like I already said, they know how to win in March with their nucleus of this team with Max Asmus. And then also Kareem Thompson, he's the third most productive player for them as well. He was on the 2021 Sweet 16 run as well. So that's right. We're going with experience over youth, even though Duke has looked pretty good. But, okay, ACC didn't really inspire me a lot this year. So the fact that they got a little hot in the ACC tournament and at the end of their season, it's good. John Shire's doing great things with that good recruiting class, but... 
it, it's not against the classic ACC that you have known to love. Now, speaking of the ACC, that's right. We are going to go with an ACC team. Virginia minus five and a half against the Furman Paladins. This is one of the early games. 12-40 tip-off. 40% of the bets are on the Cavs. Everyone is loving themselves some dins right now. This is one of the most popular bet. 13 seeded teams against the four seed, but we are going to go with the four seed. We are going to go with the style of basketball that everyone absolutely positively hates, except for me. I love watching Bennett ball, and that's probably the biggest weakness that I have as a person. If you can find a better one, please keep that to yourself. I'm very fragile. Uh, so with that said, Virginia looked terrible against Duke in the ACC Tournament Championship game, but I think a lot of that was the length that Duke possessed. They made life miserable for Virginia on offense, as if watching Virginia's offense isn't miserable enough for most of you people. Um, but yeah, Furman doesn't possess the length that Duke has. I don't think that it's going to be as impossible to get the offense going for Virginia as it looked when, well, most of the public watched them against Duke. So I think it's a different matchup here. Yes, Furman does some things well, but we're going to go Virginia minus five and a half for this game individually. Going to tinker that a bit when we go announce our parlay at the end of this, but stay tuned for that. Now, prop bet numero uno of the tournament we are going to bet. We're going to go to a familiar face, Julius Marble, the prodigal son, transferred to Texas A&M. They are taking on Penn State. This game will tip off at like 10, 15 p.m. This one is for the sickos. I cannot wait to watch every second of this one. His over-under for points in this game individually is 8.5 points. He is averaging 9.2 on the season, and he has been very up and down this season. But I do like the matchup against Penn State. Not overly imposing on the interior. Those Nittany Lions aren't. And then they also have a very, very low block rate. So not an imposing front court for Julius Marble to go against. And also, if you just want to throw all laxes and O's and analytics out the window, it's just fun to root for a kid that was, well, very easy to root for. So over eight and a half points for Julius Marble. And last but not least, get your toothbrushes out for this one. We are going Colgate, team total. Over 67 and a half points against Texas. This game will tip off at 725. And in, sorry, since February has started, Colgate has scored under 70 points just twice. They have scored over 90 points four of those times. I get that Texas is a power five school, a very good one at that, as opposed to who Colgate has been playing against. But Colgate. Okay, they are the number one shooting team in the country. They shoot 40% from three. So, yes, while the competition isn't that great, you're still playing with a round ball on a 10-foot hoop. These guys bomb it from three. They make it rain from three. So, hey, I think this will be a very up-tempo game as well. So, over 67 in a half. I like Colgate climbing over that total. So, let's put together a little parlay here on FanDuel. All right, it's going to be Illinois plus one and a half, like we said. It's going to be Oral Roberts plus six and a half, like we said. When building these parlays, if I have an underdog, I'm always going to take the points. Virginia money line, though. That's right, we're going to ignore the minus five and a half for this parlay. So Virginia money line. Julius Marble over eight and a half points. Colgate team total over 67 and a half points. That gets you plus 100 sorry 1803 odds that's a long way of saying bet five dollars to win ninety dollars and 17 cents again you don't have to break the bank on these bets i'm a very low unit better five dollars but that's going to pay out ninety dollars and 17 cents so hey if you want that go for it if you want to tail that if you want to fade everything i just said well that's going to be even greater odds for you if you take Furman. Money line instead of Virginia money line. So any way you slice it, well, that's what I got for the five best bets. We will be back doing this again tomorrow. We will be talking about tomorrow's game as well. I'm going to have eight or ten random thoughts. That's just how we're going to do the podcast. Just get everything off our chest, whether they're stats, worries, dreams for the game. You know where to find us. Locked on Spartans. I love you all. Let's do it just one more day. Come on. Let's go. Go green.